So I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of the future. And I'm not talking about science fiction. I'm not talking about 50 years out, 100 years out. I'm not talking about what your children and what your grandchildren are going to experience. I'm talking about things that we're all going to experience, and we're all going to see, we're all going to be part of. We can't run from it. The trouble is that technology is no longer moving um, um, linearly. It's moving exponentially. The competition for Fortune 100 company is no longer from overseas, as um, people believe. It's literally two guys in a garage coming out of nowhere with an exponential technology. And that creates disruption. It creates opportunity. What Ray Kurzweil, who is the greatest futurist of our time, says is that whenever any technology becomes an information technology, it starts advancing exponentially. All of these fields are now becoming information technologies. They are now in exponential mode. Let me show you. you know, take the sensors. We've, sensors are our cameras, our GPSs, our accelerometers, smoke detectors, microphones, temper, you know, thermometers, barometers. These are sensors. Right? We've seen these old sensors from the beginning of time. Let's see what's happening to them right now. Take the uh, digital camera which Kodak invented in 1976. Okay? It was 0.01 megapixels. It weighed about four pounds. It cost $10,000. Today, you can get uh, 10 megapixel for, you know, in fact, it's not, it's not even $10. It's probably 2 or $3 right now. The price has dropped exponentially. Your iPhones, your smartphones have uh, high-definition cameras in them. Those high-definition cameras, as recently as 15 years ago, were considered uh, for high-end studios. And they cost tens of thousands of dollars. They were very expensive, very large. Today, you go around with them in your pocket, you hardly ever use them. And here's what becomes possible. This is an opportunity for you folks. You know, what I'm trying to do is to get you to stop thinking about doing more IT services, you know, you know, going to these IT shops and uh, doing the same brain dead uh, you know, code maintenance we've done from the beginning of time. Think bigger. Why don't you start re automating cities? I, mean, we were talking, I was talking to Fernando about um, uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Sao Paulo early on, complete mess, it makes New York look like a dream, right? Well, why not equip the entire city with sensors? Sensors don't cost anything. Connect them using uh, Wi-Fi or other devices and now be able to predict traffic, check, you know, manage pollution, manage parking, and re-automate the entire city. It would cost practically nothing. You're talking about a few million dollars worth of sensors for, to outfit the entire city, to transform it, have a central dashboard by which you can monitor it, give people cheap tablets that they can have in their cars, which tell them which way to go, which no way not to go, which, which um, points to avoid. These are things you could be building. Garbage collection, water leakages, vehicle diagnostics. You can be automating entire cities. You know, this may surprise you, but as of this year, it is cheaper to manufacture in the USA and in Europe than it is in China. This is something which people don't seem to comprehend, that because of robotics, the price, the cost of labor has dropped to about 2 or $3 an hour in the USA. That assumes expensive electricity. Sao Paulo, what are we, you know, I'm sure a lot of the traffic there is delivery vehicles. Right, right now, if you want to get pizza, you send a two-ton truck there to deliver pizza, to de deliver these little pieces of paper. Remember those letters, those emails we used to get in the, in, in, uh, the post box? Letters? I don't get letters anymore, but uh, the old-fashioned emails. Well, you have these big, huge trucks and human beings going and drop them in post boxes. Why do you need human beings for that? Why do you need trucks for that? Why can't you simply deliver them via drone? Why can't you set up drone-to-drone -drone networks within um, um, uh, Brazil or Argentina or all over Latin America? Why, what are you waiting for? It's not that these cost millions of dollars. You can buy a very high-end drone which does everything you want for about $1,500 or so. For about $2,000, you can probably send a few pounds of weight on it, and it'll be self-guiding. It'll work with uh, the same GPS systems you have in your phones. And the prices are dropping 20 or 30% a year. So by the time you've tested the system, it'll cost half or less than it does today. So what's stopping you right now from, from uh, automating South America and building the technology there, perfecting it there, and then bringing it to the United States? Because by the time the US gets over its, uh, its internal battles, you could have perfected the technology in Latin America and have a showcase there. Low-end 3D printers cost about $500. Higher-end 3D printers cost a few thousand dollars. 
for about $50,000, you can get, get an industrial strength 3D printer that'll print metal. So almost anything you can design, you can print. The advantage of 3D printing is that complexity is free. All of these objects here were printed with 3D printers. Well, why don't you have 3D printers now in your home countries? Why don't you start developing the expertise? Because tomorrow, virtually all of our goods will be 3D printed. What we will need is designers. Well, what if Latin America you know, got a jump start on it and started uh, 3D printing objects and setting up services for American companies who want to do 3D printing? Because the, com the complexity over there is in design, learning how to design. Well, what if you started training up young kids out of your colleges in doing 3D design? You don't have to pay them high salaries, but they now become the next IT services opportunity for Latin America. My prediction is that within a decade, China's manufacturing industry is toast. <laughs> India's call center industry is toast. IT industry will still be around for 10 years, stagnant. Next, next two or three years, it'll still grow four or five, six percent, and then start dropping. So this IT services industry that you're you know, going after is a declining, it's a losing game. 3D printers will come along in the 2020s and put the robots out of business. In fact, it's going to move so fast that the robots go on strike and say, stop the 3D printers, they're taking our jobs away. Already you're seeing a change in finance. You're now seeing these uh, uh, new devices by which you can accept credit cards. Before you need, used to have credit card readers, now taxi drivers have, have square readers or PayPal readers. Restaurants are now taking credit cards interactively on smartphones with these uh, new devices. Currency, we've heard the, uh, the, um, the controversy about Bitcoin. Bitcoin may or may not make it, but it doesn't matter. Governments are getting into the act. The Canadian government, for example, is looking to develop a digital currency. Give it time, and, and most likely all currency will go digital. Why do we need physical currency anymore? And then you go to India, and they have the largest IT project in world history happening there right now. About two-thirds of a billion people have already been ID'd. The biometric scans have been taken. It's called the Adhar project. Imagine now being able to, buy, uh, to wire money directly from the government to people based, based on biometrics. India spends a lot on social welfare. The problem is that it gets stolen by layer after layer after layer of corrupt official. It starts with the, with the uh, chief ministers and the governments. Then it goes down to the bureaucrats below them. It goes down layer after layer after layer. The result is that 80, 90 percent of the money for social welfare is siphoned off by all the crooks in between, by the thieves in between, the government officials. Well, what if you could go directly from the bank accounts of, uh, of the government to the people? This is where India is headed with, uh, with the biometrics. This, is, uh, this could transform India. Medicine. This is what my last Washington Post uh, uh, article was about, about the disruption that medicine is going to happen in medicine. We're talking about prevention versus cure. We're talking about now having our devices. For example, my iPhone has an EKG monitor on it, electrocardiograph. You know, I'm a heart patient. When I go to the, the, the doctor, he charges me hundreds of dollars to get a, a simple test done. I just touch the two leads on my phone, it does an EKG, it costs me zero. Imagine now having all these other sensors on it, wearable devices, having everything connected to your smartphone, uploading data on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. We'll have sensors for disease, uh, we'll have sensors for uh, everything, you know, like I said, every functioning of our body we'll have sensors for. And then the role of AI. You remember IBM Watson, which beat Jeopardy players? Watson has already learned cancer. It is a better uh, oncologist than any human being right now because it has the latest knowledge. There's so much information, um, there's so many advances in medicine that doctors can't keep up. Our doctors went to, to medical school 10, 20, 30 years ago. Do you think they're busy studying up? They're busy spending their money. They're busy drinking. They're not, they don't spend their idle time learning about all the advances that have happened. This is the advantage that uh, AI technologies have. They know about the latest advances as they happen. They know about everything about our medical history. When you go and get a medical, when you go to a doctor, how much time does your doctor spend with you? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if you're lucky? But the advantage of AI physicians is that they have all of your data. They know you from childhood. 
They know where you've been, what you've done. They know what your symptoms are. They look at the entire body, the, the whole versus the individual. And then the biggest advances are going to happen with genomic medicine. 12 years ago, our, our genome was sequenced. It cost about $3 billion to, to get there. Today, a full human genome cost $1,000 a sequence, $1,000. At the rate things are going, um, near sure 2019 or so, I'll show you my iPhone case that does a complete human genome sequence. Kirk, will you invite me back then? All right, I'll bring that iPhone case with me. 2019, 2020 or so. The cost will be practically zero to sequence the human genome, which means we've become software, and now you can start analyzing uh, human data just like you analyze any other software, any other uh, data. So big data is a huge opportunity, especially when it applies to health. My advice is get into it ASAP, don't waste time. And start with healthcare because there are a lot of sick people in the world everywhere. You don't have, you're not competing with anyone to, other than the local doctors to heal them. And then um, outsourcing to crowdsourcing. Um, already you're finding that uh, small tasks are being outsourced more and more. As well, mid-sized tasks are being outsourced. This is going to disrupt the IT services industry more and more because it's going to become simpler to build apps and you're going to be outsourcing them. So if you don't transform yourself, the industry is going to kill you, basically. That, that's where we're headed. Work to micro work. Already you're seeing major changes happening on that front. In fact, I, I, needed to create a, I wanted to write a book about women in innovation. Rather than writing it myself, I had 500 women write it with, with me. Within six, six weeks, we did, did the work that would have taken us two or three years, and I, I was able to crowd create a book. This is what's possible right now. The bottom line is that the trillion dollar opportunity is happening at the intersection of exponential technologies. Disruptions are happening everywhere. Latin America has huge opportunities. It can become America's automated workshop, its R&D center, and its exponential technologies back office. You folks need to move forward and think, think exponentially. Thank you so much, Vivek. We really appreciate it. Uh, one of the things I want to start out with is uh, your, your traditional bread and butter, one of the areas of great strength for you has been entrepreneurship. And when we look at the question of what if, some of the 3D design, a lot of the great innovations you talked about today, what is it going to take to enable a lot of these entrepreneurs, particularly out of Latin America, to seize that opportunity? That's what's holding Latin America back. I mean, uh, government regulations, fear of failure, social stigma with entrepreneurship, that's what has to change. And, and um, when I went to Chile a, a few years, about three years ago, the government had invited me to look at the IT services industry. They were showing off about the fact that they had grown an $800 million IT services industry. I had researched Chile's education system, and uh, despite the fact that they had you know, invited me and treated me like a VIP over there, I told them that the IT services system is, is doomed. They were shocked. They didn't believe me. This is the people from Corfo. So I went back and I wrote a Business Week article about it. And suddenly it, you know, it circulated all over Chile, and then later on the economics minister came to uh, Stanford, and Nico Shea and I met him, and we talked about doing uh, about uh, uh, you know what should Chile do instead of IT services. I said, look, you have a small population, 15, 16 million people. Rather than trying to be like India, try to be like Israel or Finland. Focus on people. Focus on entrepreneurship. So he says, you know, uh, he was very frank. But he says, our people are not entrepreneurs. That they don't think like that. I said, let's do an experiment. Let's try transforming them. Let's bring foreign entrepreneurs here and see if we can get, uh, motivate local entrepreneurs to be more entrepreneurial. So I, I helped them design a program called Startup Chile. Startup Chile actually pays people $40,000 to come there uh, and, and just be there for six months. Within three years, uh, Chile has gone from having practically no entrepreneurship there to now being called Chilicon Valley. So Economist did a uh, you know, cover piece in which they profiled Chilicon Valley. So that's how far it went that you go to Santiago right now, it's buzzing with entrepreneurship. Five years ago, if you wanted to start a company, the first thing you needed to do was raise venture capital. Now you need to go and ask mom and dad, maybe your uncle and aunts, to lend you $10,000, and you can start a company. That's how it is in Silicon Valley. Or you go on Kickstarter, and you raise, you raise money. Venture capitalists have become irrelevant. In Silicon Valley, 10 years ago, seven years ago, the venture capitalists were king. Everyone used to bow down, oh my god, he's a venture capitalist. Now you go to Silicon Valley events, Nah, he's a venture capitalist. What is the loss for this country for not uh, getting their act together in immigration? 
52% of the startups in Silicon Valley have been founded by immigrants. Um, the US has been a melting pot. The reason why it's the most innovative land in the world is because of immigrants. Now, because of the exodus, because people are leaving America, you have technology centers developing all over the world. So uh, the US is going to wake up five or 10 years from now and say, what was, what was wrong with us? Why did we chase all these people away? Why do we have so much competition right now? Is it the responsibility of the uh, Latin Americans to say, hey, look at the great things we're doing, or is it the responsibility from us and the rest of the world, particularly North America, to get more accurate about the perception of what the region is? Both things need to be done. The perception is wrong, but, but Latin America needs to start leaping forward. It is, it is a unique opportunity right now. You know, India did this with IT services. Go back 30 years, Indians were beggars and snake charmers. Now when, uh, when, now when Americans see us, they're worried they're going to take our jobs away. Did that happen within 30 years? How did it happen? Because India leaped into IT services and suddenly started taking American jobs away. <laughs>